All right, kia ora koutou. Welcome everybody uh, to this event tonight. My name is Ollie Nees and it's a pleasure to have you all here at 2.57 and welcome also to those watching online uh, to this week's session of the Fabian Society. Uh, the topic this week is on rising prices, the cost of living and what a left response to all of this should be. For, for someone of my age that is born in the early 1990s or later, um, the word inflation can sound a bit like something you know, from the history books, something conjuring up images of cash-filled wheelbarrows. Um, and, and indeed, for a long time now, inflation, generally speaking, has been, has been quite low by historical standards. Generally speaking, things haven't, generally speaking across the economy, um, things have, have been getting ex more expensive, um, but not that quickly. But now it seems uh, history is back. Uh, since mid-2021, inflation has been running hot across the economy. Um, and this year, annual inflation in New Zealand is at a 32-year high, I believe. And this, of course, is having a huge impact on households, particularly given the rising price of food uh, and fuel and other essentials. But the question of uh, how this has all come about and what's driving it is, of course, hotly contested. Uh, some people point to the pandemic and the response of governments in terms of monetary and fiscal policy to the pandemic. Others point to the war in Ukraine. Uh, others point to uh, record profits being reached and, and re being reaped in some, some industries. Uh, but of course, the, the debate is not only contested, it's also inherently political. Uh, because of course, the question of what's driving the crisis folds quickly into the question of what we should do about it. Uh, and it's perhaps no surprise then that those on the right might be more quick to point to um, public spending as a driver behind the crisis rather than um, profit taking. And it strikes me as someone who doesn't really know at all what I'm talking about that it's those narratives on the right that do tend to dominate um, the way we talk about these issues. Uh, and often, you know, the speculations of um, people that might have skin in the game are reported on as fact rather than informed speculation. Uh, and the fact that all of this is fiercely contested um, can tend to be obscured. But today we have two people who hopefully will help us walk through some of these issues um, and figure out what a left response to this crisis looks like, whether we are close to that already uh, or whether we have a long way to go. First, we'll hear from Dr. Jeff Bertram, um, an economist with the Victoria University of Wellington's Institute of Policy and Governance Studies, who's written extensively on income and wealth distribution, regulatory economics, amongst a, a wide range of other issues. In recent years, especially, he's uh, published a series of papers on regulatory capture, uh, the Commerce Act, and the ways in which, uh, in his view, if I can summarise, they enable um, profiteering uh, and the exploitation of some of our most vulnerable consumer groups. After Jeff, we'll hear a little from, from Craig Rennie. Um, Craig is a now the policy director and economist for the Council of Trade Unions uh, and a former advisor to Grant Robertson. And his presence here today is timely. Uh, in the last few days, the Council of Trade Unions, along with First Union and the, uh, the Climate Group 350, have published a report which found that the major energy entailers have been paying out billions in excess dividends to shareholders, starving the market of investment in renewables uh, and rising prices uh, during uh, the present cost of living uh, situation. So what's going on here? I'll pass it over to Jeff uh, and we'll pick it up from there. Okay, thanks, Ollie. Um, uh, it's not true that history is back. History never went away. And, um, and the left particularly needs to remember the history. The 20th century uh, witnessed a very big victory for what I would call the left project. That's the social democratic version of it um, and a defeat for the more revolutionary part of the project. Um, but that only lasted until about the 1960s or 70s with construction of the welfare state and, and Thomas Piketty's uh, falling share of the top 1% and so on. And the last half century uh, has seen a turnaround. And so what we're going to talk about today is in fact grounded partly in that turnaround in history, the shift of the, of the really big forces that work over very long spans of time, particularly balances of 
what used to be called class force, but it's hard to really pin the classes down these days. But the, um, the, the things that, uh, that I work with are the categories of income like wages, profits and rent. And we're, shift, we're, showing, we're seeing shifting shares of those in the product of society. And with those shifting shares come tensions. And some of those tensions spill over into what we, what we call inflation. Uh, so, all this big fuss. Inflation, I'm going to say first off, is not the cost of living. Right? And inflation is just a change in the purchasing power of money. The cost of living is about the ability of ordinary households to get and pay for the essential requirements for a decent life. And it's the failure of those second that is at the centre of what I'm going to be saying. Um, and necessarily, I'm less wildly excited about the first. But if you're a holder of financial assets, inflation is a big deal because it erodes the real value of your assets and the interest rate determines the return you get on those assets. So if you're one of those people, there are two things you really want in the world. You want high interest rates and you want, uh, you want low inflation. In other words, protect the value of your money and get a big return on it. So who do you see lining up to push the Reserve Bank and the government into high interest rates in order to get inflation down dominantly from the financial part of the business community? And uh, it, it always annoys me, and it's coming up for 7 o'clock in the morning, that Radio New Zealand is so totally in the pockets of the banks that when they say economists think, they actually mean bank economists think, because you hardly ever get any economist other than one of the bank economists on that slot on Radio New Zealand. Uh, and I'll come back in a, a little later to what one of them was saying this morning. So, um, because they dominate political and media debate, we do get a single-minded focus on raising interest rates, and a promise that that will reduce inflation. Actually, it's not quite clear that rising interest rates are the key to reducing inflation. Again, I'll come back to that. But they work against domestically generated inflation only if they cause collateral social damage in the form of uh, unemployment, recession, misery for low-income groups, and misery for highly indebted households, uh, of whom there are quite a lot, and quite a few of them in the lower part of the income distribution. Now, a really important thing is that high interest rates in New Zealand will not save us from global inflation. Um, we are being swept along at a global tide of inflation, driven largely out of the United States and Europe. And as we raise interest rates in New Zealand, the United States and the Europeans are raising their interest rates too. The idea that we raise our rates, our exchange rate appreciates, that means that we cancel out the overseas inflation and we can control our own inflation is nuts. So Luke Melpass in the Dom Post this morning was peddling that stuff as usual, um, and it simply isn't true. Um, he says the system of monetary policy targeting is designed so we're in charge of our own inflation destiny regardless of what's going on in other countries. That's simply flatly wrong. Um, there's a lot more to the cost of living crisis than that. So I generally think of the inflation process as the way that a market system resolves conflicts that haven't been resolved in some other way. If you want to preempt inflation, you have to resolve somehow other, some, in some other way the conflicts that are producing the inflationary pressure. So one of them is a generalised supply-demand imbalance. Another one is excess money balances spilling over into the hoarding or purchasing of goods as stores of value. Another one is distributional contests among the great classes. And another one is relative price changes. When prices are sticky downwards, the way that you get changes in relative prices is to raise some prices and drag up the general price level in the process. And I'm going to show you a chart in a moment um, which, is, which speaks volume about that. Conventional monetary policy is only about half of the first one. It's the demand side of the excess, so I guess, demand story. The neoliberal model means that there's no incentive to ask seriously about the causes of inflation nor its differential impacts on different groups in society, nor about exactly how the interest rate mechanism actually works. Left approaches, as I understand them, and you know, I don't speak for the left, I'm just me, um, but as I understand them, it seeks to address the underlying structural tensions in market capitalism, from which inflationary and cost of, pressure living, uh, cost of living pressures derive and possibly resolve them in a progressive way. And in particular, a left position, it seems to me, gives priority to opposing the regressive distributional consequences of both inflation and anti-inflation policy under the current regime. So 
just a list of things that it seems to me a left perspective is grounded on. Uh, emphasis on the virtues of collective action and agency. Individual freedoms are subject to the constraint of the common good. Limitations on gross inequality of wealth and power and income with a priority on the poor, the weak and the marginalised. Reject the idea of markets as moral arbiters. In other words, the market does not have moral authority and limit the spheres of activity where market forces are allowed to play and be always aware that at the outside boundaries of the economy there is scarcity of resources and in, in a small open economy in a limited planet, ultimately planetary boundaries will limit what's achievable. So the key issues affecting the cost of living, and these are the ones that I'm going to sort of be running over. Market power is the first one, as indicated before, the degree of monopoly and its regulation and non-regulation. It's a long-standing concern of left-wing macroeconomics. It goes right back to the 1930s and the writing of Kaletsky. Um, and uh, it's been central to the way that I think about what's been happening in New Zealand and in Fiji and Western capitalism in the last half century. Distributional struggles among workers, capitalists, rentiers and rent seekers. Um, and just a little point that um, it, you may notice at the moment Labor's bargaining power is going up quite sharply. There's a worldwide scarcity of available labour. Exactly why that is, uh, not going to talk about today. Um, but the consequences are that in the short run there's an increase in the bargaining power of labour. But notice that just as fair pay agreements come over the horizon and the labour begins to get wage increases, wages are still not rising at the rate that inflation's going up. Um, and if you listen to Radio New Zealand this morning, you would have heard the, bank, heard the West Bank banker saying, gee, we mustn't let this go through to wages. We have to dampen down inflation before wages take off because we can see them taking off. So uh, the bargaining power of labour has temporarily increased, but whether it's a long-term increase will depend on whether the reserve army of labour stays limited or grows quite sharply under the impact of the r massive increase in interest rates being pushed along by the American Reserve, the Federal Reserve. Then there are big trends in global capitalism, deregulation, financialisation and breaking the power of labour. There's the planetary boundaries, which mean that there are looming cost burdens coming up, which are going to have to be shared around somehow. So there's a whole lot of stuff here, and you notice I haven't barely mentioned the Reserve Bank or, or the, uh, uh, the official cash rate. Now here are, here are some indices of prices. Um, and this is runs from 2010, so it's 10 years ago, up to where we are now, uh, which is the third quarter of 2022. The green line is the average hourly wage, and yeah, you'll notice it's above all the others. It is true that real wages have been going up in the sense that the hourly wage rate is rising faster than the cost of living, strictly speaking. But the heavy blue line through here is the labour cost index, which is the, which is the um, uh, cost of labour for, for employers when it's adjusted for labour productivity changes. And what you can see going on is that up to about the third quarter of 2020, a uh, year and a half ago or so, or a couple of years ago, um, these things were moving pretty much in sync. Labour costs and the producer prices, these two lines here, and consumer prices down here, and the household um, price index, were all sort of coming along pretty much in a bunch. And then suddenly, four of them took off, and one of them only took off slowly. So here is the, the price surge leading the rise in the labour cost index. And what that says to you is something is driving this inflation process that is quite unrelated to wage setting. All right? And any story that says to fix inflation we have to stop wages from rising and we have to have high unemployment is missing the point. Uh, it's not what we're looking at here. So there are currently three separate inflation shocks. First off, and I'm going to talk about this for a little bit, is the long-running issue in New Zealand of, of unregulated market power on the supply side of the New Zealand economy. Secondly is the recent global inflation triggered by COVID, the, U the Ukraine war, and by policies run in other countries. That's a, mostly a supply side thing as well. And then there's the monetary consequences of the New Zealand domestic policy response to COVID. And so we get, here are the sorts of supply constraints you can have that, that when demand pushes up against them, they can lead to higher prices. Two, there's two sorts of them. Some are externally imposed and some of them we create ourselves. 
The externally imposed ones in the long run is the global resource constraint, the high level use of market power. If you remember the 70s, that was, o that was OPEC driving up the oil price. That was just a raw, outright exercise of market power to basically raise the price and shift wealth and income in fa favour of the suppliers of oil. And as the consequences of that worked through the Western economies, we had a period when, until, until, we, until somebody picked up the burden of that, uh, we had an inflation surge. In the short run, there's stuff like Ukraine and COVID. Locally created, what do we do ourselves that predisposes the economy to potential inflationary pressures? Run down public infrastructure and services, unchecked market power of monopolists, scarce resources being allocated to the most powerful bidders. We're exporting all these logs, but we can't get enough timber to sawn timber to build houses. Why? Because of very rational market choices by the people who handle the timber supply chain. Um, no manpower planning, as the nurses keep reminding us. And in the short run, there are things like opportunistic hoarding, which we saw earlier this year with plasterboard. Then there are demand surges that can also trigger price rises, sharp increase in the current incomes of some groups, or a reallocation of inflated wealth portfolios. And I'm going to say a little bit more about this later on. Um, if you have a, uh, this is the old Keynesian theory of liquidity preference for those who've done their old economics. Um, you have a lot of people sitting on liquid assets and they decide that they want to move out of those liquid assets into, into a different store of value. They go looking for something to buy, all right? Housing for a while. But, you know, the housing thing runs its course. What else do you go look at buy? You're looking to buy durable goods that you can put aside and that will hold their value, in, particularly in an inflationary period. And that's, a, that's a, a process that we haven't seen a lot of work done on recently, but I think it's probably going to show up. And another part of that is the realisation of capital gains uh, by using housing as equity to fund consumption expenditure. Right, so where am I going? Well, I'm going to try and keep it not too long. A bit about market power, a bit about distribution, a bit about modern monetary theory, and a bit about the role and size of government. And then the, then the, the, main, the main cause comes. First point. The cost of living crisis is not new in New Zealand. This one has been brewing for a long time. The 0-3% inflation track is that brown line, the consumer price index, which is what everybody focuses on. The red line is the price index for non-tradables, and the green line is the price index for tradables. Now, if you're a producer of non-tradables, you are a happy person because you've got uh, m more than doubling of your price index since 2000, or since 1999. If you're a producer of tradables, in general, you're a less happy person. You've only picked up um, about 30% uh, or so uh, over, that, over that couple of decades, right? This is a, this is a relative price shift of very large proportions in favour of people who produce and sell non-tradable goods and therefore against those who produce and sell tradable goods. Right. So just think about who these are. Oh, and, by, and this is something, this is really important. Um, this is 2021, right at the end here. Look at the way that we, we've got an uptick. All right. Now, an uptick in tradables in the face of Ukraine and COVID Perfectly straightforward. That's that's world. That's a world price increase, a, a supply shock hitting the world economy, and it comes through to the CPI. But an uptick in non-tradables right at the same time. They're not faced with external competition. They're not meeting world prices. They're setting their own prices in the New Zealand market without competition directly, and they tick right up. In fact, they tick up more sharply than the tradables do. That's indexation. That is, in my view, the non-tradable sector simply able to pass straight through with an add-on the expectation that everybody's got that, gee, there's an inflation surge going on. So let's have a look at the, um, where the budget items are. The non-tradable series contains goods and services that do not face foreign competition, says that's New Zealand. So here are the non-tradables. And in the household budget, this is the part of non-tradables, that is rent, housing costs, rates, electricity, one of my favourites, and gas, all right? Nearly half of the non-tradables index 
is coming out of those particular items. Over here are the tradables. All right. And then tradables transport and food at the biggies. So here's, here's the oil companies, here's the supermarkets. So it, if you had any idea that tradables was a place where there's no market power being exercised, and I'm telling you it's wildly competitive, you're wrong. No, uh, there's plenty of monopoly behaviour going on, especially in those two, with very little being done about them. OK, so we're looking here, therefore, at the fact that perfect competition and imperfect competition are quite different. And competitive markets can be quite desirable, but they are often the exception, not the rule in small economies. And if, un if you have uncompetitive markets, you get the strong chopping up the weak in them. So one of the things that you look at for, as an indicator of market imperfection is markups. Um, that's just straightforward. Oh, and just a couple of familiar policy responses, and just reminding you of the problem if you have uncompetitive markets. If you announce that you're going to pay an extra $50 a week to, as on the student allowance, uh, is it any surprise that rents go up $50 a week? Because uh, rents come from ability to pay. If you increase the ability to pay without doing anything to regulate the supply, you simply get a straight pass through into the pockets of landlords. The winter energy payment uh, it keeps up the price of gas and electricity and the profits of the companies that supply those things. And because it's well announced in advance, those companies know that they're going to be able to recover all that revenue that might otherwise have gone missing if a whole lot of households turned the lights out. And one of the ones that I keep getting asked about taking off GST from fruit and vegetables. Now, here's a competitive market. Here's the supply curve. Here's the demand curve. I'm not going to give you too much economics today. But suppose you take off GST in a competitive market, then that comes off the supply price. So the supply curve shifts down and the price falls. It doesn't go quite 15% down because you have to allow for the slope of the demand curve. But you get a good pass through there by taking off GST. But what about a, a, an uncompetitive market? In an uncompetitive market, supply is set by, the, by firms with market power, profit maximising. The GST comes off. The suppliers know that the market will pay that price. They've been collecting it. So take off GST and the suppliers simply collect the extra revenue and, and you don't pay any less. Now, it's not as clean as that, but nevertheless, don't, don't pin your hopes on GST reductions unless you've got really effective pro-competition policy in place, especially at the supermarkets. I'm nostalgic about these things. Uh, I just want to remind you what the Kirk government put in place as its Commerce Act. The Commerce Act 1975 said this. Every person commits an offence who, whether as principal or agent, whether by himself or his agent, sells or agrees or offers to sell any goods or services at a price which is unreasonably high. <laughs> Woo! Nothing in this Act or in any other Act shall prevent the conviction of any person under this section, notwithstanding the fact that the marginal markup they applied was not unlawful. Whew! Every person who commits an offence is liable, individual, a fine not exceeding 10,000 or imprisonment not exceeding six months, a company, a fine not exceeding 50,000, but if the offence is continuing, a fine not exceeding 2,500 for every day it continues. Now notice two things about that Act. One of them, it allows market studies and criminal procedures to be initiated by the judicial authorities or by the regulatory authorities. All right. The examiner of trade practices was entitled to start up a market study any time he liked into plasterboard or supermarkets or oil companies or insurance companies or banks or electricity and could then pass the findings to the Commerce Commission and they could then take it to the courts and the courts could convict. Under the Commerce Act 1986, the neoliberal one, everything is political whole thing has been politicised. Nothing moves until the Minister of Commerce initiates a study and he's subject to all the usual political pressures and lobbying. So supermarkets, oil companies, plasterboard manufacturers, banks, electricity, all that stuff, we just watch this political game being played rather than watching a regulatory process going through. And the second thing about that act is if you go back and look at the history, there's all that talk about polar shipyards, those powers were actually used very sparingly. 
you will not find a huge number of convictions under the 1975 Commerce Act. Reason? It's a very good deterrent. With the, with the Act in place, behaviour adjusted. With the Act taken away in 1986, behaviour has adjusted again the other way. So, quick check on margins. This is just uh, the markup on prime cost, a bit of Bill Rosenberg's work um, since the, the mid-1970s through, through the early 2020s. You can identify when it all took off, of course, through the 80s and 90s. Rogenomics changed the ground rules. First was the Commerce Act, second the Employment Contracts Act, third is the State Only Enterprises Act, fourth is the Reserve Bank Act and the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Won't go into those. You probably know about them. Reversing all of those would be part of a possible left agenda and would, fit, would do two things. It would provide more tools for managing inflationary episodes and it would put a check on the locally generated inflation drivers that I've been talking about. But there's no silver bullet there that will insulate us from global inflationary pressures. We are part of Western capitalism and a major inflationary episode in Western capitalism is going to come through to us. And that's true not only of the 70s and 20s when we got high inflation, it's true of the 1990s and 2000s when we had low inflation. The great moderation was a global phenomenon that we just simply cruised along on it. Don't give the Reserve Bank too much credit. What domestic policy can do is to change the distributional impacts of inflation within the New Zealand community when external shocks come in. So just a word about distributional conflict. <coughs> the orthodox view is that there is perfect competition in flexible markets. So regulation and Keynesianism and all sorts of things are terrible. But then when they come to monetary policy, there is a terror of workers. It's called the Phillips curve. It's a fear of workers' market power and bargaining power in setting off inflation. And full employment is equated with wage inflation, so unemployment has to be maintained. Under imperfect competition, that's just class war and camouflage. Workers gain strength and booms. Employers gain strength and slump. Let's have slumps. That's what it boils down to. And insofar as the old left used to accept the logic of this, and they did, and still, I think, largely do, it is true that full employment is a powerful tool in the hands of organised labour if they choose to use it. Um, the old Keynesian left added policies to protect wages and benefits and to curb market power to try to prevent some of the worst consequences. So this is, I'm just going to take you to my third year macroeconomics course of a decade or two ago. Again, I won't spend too much time on the economics, but it's kind of nice to be able to draw the skeleton. This is, well, actually, this is the brain. This is a central banker's brain. Here, at the top, is the value of total output per worker. We're measuring output in million dollars up there. And uh, here's employment along here. There's output per worker. Uh, every uh, open economy uses imported inputs, so the you have to meet the cost of imported inputs, so the revenue from selling the pro the, that product has to be reduced by that amount. Um, then there's a profit margin, which is the decision of the producer, the employer, the supplier. And then what's left over at the bottom is a real wage that's consistent with that profit margin. Notice the order of business. First, the import bill must be met. That's inescapable. We're not powerful enough to run the world. Second, the profit margin is covered. Why? Because the supplier has the market power and they can dictate what their markup is and what price they sell at. Third, workers are the bottom, bottom end of the queue in terms of what they actually get as a real wage. But, hey, here's what workers would like. This is the, called the WS curve. And it says when we've got really low, uh, low output and really high unemployment, workers are really nervous and so they won't push their luck. They'll accept quite low real wages. When we go towards full employment, workers get stroppy and demand higher wages, so the pressure comes on. So here we are at non-inflationary employment. This is the famous Nehru. You keep hearing people talking about the Nehru. That's where the Reserve Bank wants the worst to be. Here's full employment. And at full employment, the real wage that the workers 
think they can get and would like to have a go for is inconsistent with the real wage that the, that the employers are proposing to allow them. In other words, the workers' demands are squeezing the profit margin. And that conflict bursts out as inflation. Now that is actually the model that underlies a terrific amount of central bank policy making and macroeconomic thinking. Notice a couple of things about that. There are four things that can trigger inflation and there is one policy response. You can get too close to full employment, the response is raise interest rates to push up unemployment to discipline workers. You can have workers getting stroppier, they just push the WS curve up, they push harder at any level of employment. The answer is raise interest rates to discipline labour. Producers might increase their target markups and try to squeeze real wages down, creating inflation as workers try to defend their position. The answer is raise interest rates to discipline workers and make sure that they carry the burden off. And as the real cost of imports can rise, what's the answer? Raise interest rates to make sure that the burden of those higher import costs goes on to workers. And that's the imperfectly competitive and economic model. Uh, I won't read you Bill Mitchell. If you, by the way, those of you who do follow modern monetary theory, I'll put this in because Bill Mitchell is one of the uh, quite good writers in the modern monetary theory canon that he's emphasising here the fact that it, you raise, raise interest rates, you actually push up a lot of costs. Interest rates can be inflationary as well as deflationary, particularly because they push up housing costs. Mm. And so raising the interest rate in New Zealand may actually raise the inflation rate in the short run, not reduce it. Um, so there's an emphasis in MMT on distribution. And orthodox policy ignores that, but that doesn't mean that the left is the only place you go to hear about distribution. Uh, helicopter money, drop, just dropping money to people uh, in the COVID period, happened across quite a lot of countries. And what I know, what struck me was that helicopter money drops that went to the general population during COVID were from right-wing governments, not left-wing ones. Trump signing checks, Bolsonaro in Brazil, you know, um, New Zealand did helicopter drops to business. So, draw your own conclusion. But the detail of money creation and destruction does matter a lot for the distribution of income and wealth. I don't want to do the balance sheet detail. I'm pushing my time, so I'll Thanks. race along. First thing to remember about the COVID response in New Zealand is it involved very big wealth transfers from government to the private sector in the form of unrequited money handed out to, to business. A lot of that wealth was in the form of financial assets. The return on those assets depends on interest rates. And the long run value is reduced by inflation. So, of course, the interest groups who have got the new wealth from COVID want low inflation and high interest rates, and they want tax cuts as well. And their spokesperson is the National Party and Act, and they're vigorously promoting that line includes the banks, which are pulling in very large amounts of interest that are paid by taxpayers on settlement cash balances, right? which is not needed. Just the need to pay interest on settlement cash balances is, uh, shall we say, a creative bit of thinking. Now, this is the accounts of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have the November, I, I don't have the October 2022 figures, but I've got everything up to September. So we're reasonably up to date. Um, this blue line here is called claims on central government. That's government bonds that the Reserve Bank has got stuck, tucked away. In other words, the large-scale asset purchase program involved the Reserve Bank buying up a very large stack of government paper, which it's still holding. This one here, the red line, is Crown Settlement Accounts. That's cash that the government has sitting in its account at the Reserve Bank. Now, you notice something about this. These are Crown borrow, that's Crown bonds that the Reserve Bank has bought, and that's Crown cash that the Crown has stacked away. So how come 
the Crown is owing the Reserve Bank that amount of cash. Uh, the Reserve Bank is owing the Crown that amount of cash. The Crown is owing the Reserve Bank that amount in bonds that the Reserve Bank is About half of that stack of bonds is there only to enable Grant Robertson to pretend he has a biggie bank, which is actually not really there. It's just an accounting entry. But those bonds have a real, have a real significance for the way that the financial markets work. And in the background is the settlement institution's balances. This is the, the, the bank's settlement cash at the Reserve Bank. Now, when the Reserve Bank goes out and buys bonds, it puts effectively cash into circulation. It's an asset swap between bonds and cash, done mostly with the banking sector, but also with the private sector. And it comes back to, to roost in the form of settlement cash balances that the, that the banks hold at the Reserve Bank. Until 2020, the settlement balances were way down there. And then, kaboom, away they went. They're now getting on for $50 billion of them. And they pay, they're being rewarded at, what is it, 3.5% at the moment or something? You do your, do your sums in your head how much interest the banks are pulling in on those settlement cash balances as a result of the way that the monetary side of the COVID response was handled. So, I mean, it's just... That window, April 2020 to April 2021, has been fascinating me. And you'll know that the, that the right-wingers are doing a huge fuss about this period and wanting Adrian Orr to resign. I'm, I'm really fascinated by this, by the fact that in June 2020, the Treasury, the New Zealand Treasury, issued $40 billion more government debt than it needed to to cover the cost of the COVID fiscal policy. They raised $40 billion that they just then parked in an account at the Reserve Bank rather than part, making it part of the fiscal expansion. And that $40 billion <laughs> is what the Reserve Bank had to go and buy up to prevent disruption to the financial markets coming from this mass printing of government bonds. It wasn't money that was being printed, it was government bonds and they were being printed by the Debt, debt Management Office of the Treasury. That's a story that I think is yet to be written probably. But here we go, 40 billion of government borrowing was just parked as national cash. We're going to have to service that debt, of course. And the banks are getting paid the OCR on those balances. All right, the conjunction is now radically different from 2020. If we had a left government, this would be the time for serious tax increases. Mopping up excess liquid balances, clawing back the big wealth transfers to the already rich, preemptively stopping the structural trend towards feudalism as rentiers and rent exercise a growing claim on the product. Particularly important then, taxing wealth, wealth transfers, inheritance and gifts. The proceeds from rent seeking, including excessive CEO salaries, carbon emissions, all that sort of thing. Which just leads me a little bit to a little word or two about relative prices. It's time to look at how we allocate the scarce resources in the New Zealand economy. Economics is ultimately to do with allocating scarce resources. Now, if you've got supply constraints, that means that the consumption of the good or purchase of the good has to be rationed somehow. The price mechanism will do the rationing in favour of the rich or the highest bidder. So if you leave the price mechanism to ration scarce resources, they'll go where, the, they'll go where people with big checkbooks are. So it, logs get exported rather than put through local sawmills. Local sawmills close down and we're left with a, a growing oligopoly in the supply of building products. That was, I found, something that the old Forest Service complained about and warned about every year in their annual reports from 1948 through to 1986, after which the Forest Service disappeared. Every year there was a paragraph saying, for goodness sake, don't let log exports suck dry the supply of timber into the saw milling and building industry in New Zealand. Bad luck with that one. Uh, and of course, if you go to the supermarket, you pay the export parity price for your milk butter cheese. Um, as Morning Report said this morning, lamb might come down just a little bit at the moment. The world market and lamb's looking soft. Now, if you don't want the price to price makers and do the rationing, you have to have a non-price mechanism of some sort or interventions in the price mechanism, particularly to protect the poor. Now, electricity pricing is one that I've um, said a lot about, um, but there's also the construction industry. Construction industry is under a lot of stress the last two or three years, and yet there are massive retirement villages being built for the relatively affluent retired. 
sucking up the resources that Kainga Ora and, uh, and affordable housing providers have been struggling to get their hands on. All right. Um, how about um, temporary pause on all retirement village and McMansion construction until we've sorted the housing crisis? I mean, lefties only dream about these things. Real governments don't do them. But um, the role and size of the state matters a lot too. That's about real resource allocation. And the ideologically small state discourse of the, of the last few decades has been baked into policy thinking. And so the government is still working with a line in the sand, 30% of GDP. Actually, what that translates to is 16% of GDP goes on providing government services, and they won't raise that until they can kill off beneficiaries in large, in large numbers. 15 to 16% of GDP on health, education, and other government services is miserly. All right? Grant Robertson's ceiling of 30% implies a continuing heavy squeeze on those areas of public provision. Now, this is not an argument for spending for its own sake or more spending in the current policy mode. It's an argument for spend and tax, not tax and spend. Spend and tax is the modern monetary theory slogan, I guess, but I'm not trying to persuade you about modern monetary theory. It's just that they've focused on this issue quite effectively. Government spending can always occur to the amount of money required so long as the resources can be obtained, is the MMT point. But you have to make the resources available by the tax mechanism. You have to deprive some groups in society of the ability to go out there and preemptively command the, the scarce resources that you need for providing public services. The tax leg of this is absolutely vital, and there's a make or buy decision to be made in the public sector about how much you can do yourself. So summing up, there are these three dimensions of the problem. Domestic supply, where you want to have mitigation of, of inflationary and cost increases, restraint on market power, rationing access to scarce resources, and collective provision of essential services. Domestic demand, you need policies that steer that, controlling the distribution of income and wealth and tax and benefit policies, and adaptation, which is all you can do about global supply. It's the climate change problem mitigation, where you can do something, adaptation, where you simply are a victim of circumstances. So there you're going to have to live with the relative price changes that are progressive, if possible, which means, I suspect, fossil fuels are going to keep on going up um, and accelerate the local supply of substitutes, preferably renewable and, so and sustainable ones. All right, Craig, over to you. If this works, it'll be a miracle. Look at that. Um, hello, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Craig Rennie. I'm the Economist and Director of Policy at the CTU, as Ollie said beforehand. Before that, I worked as Grant Robertson's um, Economic and Political Advisor for four years. Um, before that, I worked at the Treasury and at the Reserve Bank. And tonight, I would ask you not to hold that against me um, as I continue to talk here. Um, the first Fabian Society meeting I went to was actually in 2015. And when I was a very newly minted advisor to Grant Robertson, and I sat down in a very august room at the PSA building, um, and I got told off for wearing a tie. So tonight, I'm not wearing a tie, but I still expect to be told off um, at some point in time. Now, in terms of, um, I've been asked to respond to one of New Zealand's leading economists, um, who has very, just very eloquently and extensively set out the causes of inflation in New Zealand. Um, it's a bit like being asked to engage in light sparring with Mike Tyson. So thank you very much, Fabian um, Society, for the opportunity to do so. Um, what I will say in the short period of time I want to talk to you about this tonight is this. Is that Dr. Burton's absolutely right to say that there is such a thing as a left perspective on inflation, and that collective action can lead to a progressive response to the problem. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing essential, there's nothing inevitable about both inflation and our response to it. Um, and that the key factors driving inflation right now are complex and in many, fa many cases actually predate COVID and predate our response to COVID. Um, and the current conversation um, in the media in New Zealand, um, and I swear we didn't share notes beforehand, um, is that it's been driven by a very simplistic idea of this trade-off, this idea between inflation, between wages, between employment and price growth. And 
that's not only not true, it's empirically not true. We can go back over time and show that that's not the case. But there are very large factors, there are very large forces in New Zealand who want you to believe that there is this very simple idea between if wages go up, if workers get a bit stroppy, to use the phrase, um, then oh, you know prices will continue to rise. That's not necessarily true, and certainly one of the things that certainly should be explored by a little bit more and a little bit more sensitively. Um, and that the solutions to these problems, I'll tell you what, I'll stand over this side, Jeff, and then you can see this way. Um, the solutions to these problems are to be, aren't to be found solely at number two, the terrace. Um, because loading this problem onto just the Reserve Bank actually misses out that the much of the problem lies with what used to be number one, the terrace, but is now number four, um, the terrace. Um, and with other actors and agents inside government. And in fact, actually, we did a much more wide-ranging response to the problems of pricing that we have in New Zealand and to the problems of economic development that we have in New Zealand. Um, so can I touch on a couple of areas where perhaps I can add a little bit more um, analysis to that which has already been provided um, by Dr. Bertram. Um, and first of all, can I say this? We should be careful about beating ourselves up too much right now in New Zealand. If you listen to morning reports, if you listen to the news, if you listen to read the newspapers, you'll tell us that New Zealand's coming to a, an end, that you know, uh, the cost of living is out of control, that inflation is you know, the, the number one problem in New Zealand. And this is what we call the misery index. This is consumer price index on this axis and unemployment along this axis. And in red, just here, is New Zealand. We are better off than pretty much every other developed economy in the world right now. If you had to start from somewhere, you'd far rather start from where New Zealand is right now than the UK, the US. We have lower inflation than Germany right now. Um, far lower unemployment than France, than Finland, than Sweden, than Denmark. So when you hear this story of woe is me, that, you know, that New Zealand's our, our response to COVID, our response to government spending has put us in a place that we should be really concerned about, that we should be really worried about, with the exception of Korea and Japan, and Japan spent the past two decades in deflation. In fact, getting some inflation in Japan is just about a miracle. Um, we're probably the better off, we're best off country in terms of the developed world, in terms of our current response on that CPI and unemployment measure. So we should be careful about beating ourselves up too much. And certainly the forecasts from every creditable um, economic provider, including um, you know, our private banks, um, are that inflation will fall from this point forward. So again, then that's not true of the UK. It's po you know, the US inflation has just fallen a little bit, but in other European countries, inflation's forecast to rise. And in fact, we had to take some of the data off here because countries such as Estonia and others will be off the top of the chart. Um, but their inflation's gonna continue to grow as well. So if you had to start from somewhere, New Zealand's a really good place to start from. And that's not a story that we hear right now on inflation and the cost of living. And it's certainly not a story that we hear on unemployment. And if nothing else, having a 3.3% unemployment rate is something that should be celebrated in New Zealand as a good start to help get unemployment down further. The cost of living crisis is not a new thing if you're poor. We talk about inflation and we talk about the cost of living as if it's just turned up. As if actually, you know, when tall, handsome, white economists like me, you know, we can, cost of living's turned up for us because we suddenly have to trade down to the second quality of Brie in Moore Wilson's. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it, but, you know, we, we have, you know, the, kind of, the price of Brie's gone up, love. What are we going to do here? Sort of, you know, if you are poor, if you're a beneficiary, if you're a superannuitant, your inflation rate over the past, since 2008, since we've been using the Household Living Price Index, every year and consistently over time, inflation has been higher and higher and higher than for higher income groups. For the top 20% of households by income, this red line here, um, they've seen inflation consistently lower than general inflation because they've got choices because they can spend their money where they want to. If you don't have choices, 
your inflation rate has been higher and higher and higher. And seemingly, we actually only really care about inflation when it impacts those with choices. And so for us, we should be really careful about just saying, right now, the cost of living is a problem. The cost of living has been a problem since 2012. The cost of living has been a problem since 2016. The cost of living has been a problem for the past 10, 15 years, if you're poor. And actually, the response to inflation, the response to cost of living, should be to reduce this curve, the curves at the top. This blue line, the 20% of lowest incomes by ha household incomes, if we can turn that line down, that will be genuinely a response to inflation. <clears throat> and inflation concerns are only one way. Inflation in New Zealand has a miraculous ability to only harm people in one direction. This is CPI inflation, and this is the 2% midpoint for the Reserve Bank, going back to 2012. In fact, this is when I turned up in New Zealand. I was on exactly this date. Um, and over more than half of this period of time, inflation has been below 2%. And this is growth foregone. This is actually wages foregone. This is activity foregone. But nobody was complaining about the desperate need to reduce the OCR during this period. In fact, in 2014, Graham Wheeler, just here, said inflation was about to get out of control. Inflation was 1.7%. And so we started to lift the OCR. By 2015, it had fallen to 0.6%. And it was only then he turned off the OCR increases. So we, can't, we care about inflation when it's going up. And we should. I mean, it's quite clearly increased. But we should also care when inflation is below our track rate. Because actually, we're missing out on growth and we're missing out on employment opportunities if we don't do that. And New Zealand has a strong track record of only caring about inflation when it goes above the line as much as when it goes below the line. And finally, if I just point you to rents and inflation, because one of the things that many people don't understand, I'm sure you all do, but many people outside there don't understand, is that inflation is a basket of goods. It is approximately 100 items that are measured repeatedly by Stats NZ. Um, and rents are one of those things, but rents have an outsized ability to impact upon your quality of life. They have an outsized ability to impact on the ability of you to do other things. And at the root of the crisis of the cost of living right now, arguably, is our failure to tackle the speculative housing market, which over su successive governments, we failed to do. And so if I look, again, if I start at zero in 2009, this is wages. And they've gone up 30% across the period. But if I look at median rents, that grey line, they've gone up 90%, three times the rate of wage increases over that period. Now, that's median rents, right? That's affected by the top. And that's, that's, that's clearly rent, rent at the top of the group that's going up, right? Well, OK, if I do lower quartile rents, they've actually increased a little bit faster. It's actually rents at the bottom that are driving that change. And so rents are one of the key reasons why we've seen inflation rise, and it's, and it's squeezing more and more households we don't have, who don't have the ability to pay. And when you look at household incomes um, and the work that uh, MSD does every year on, on child poverty, we can see that it's actually rents and the cost of housing that's driving poverty in New Zealand. And so unless we tackle this, we're never going to tackle our cost of living crisis in New Zealand. Now, just to give you a couple of sort of little examples of that, 96% of a minimum wage workers um, take home pay is the cost of the median rent in Wellington. So, and that was about three months ago, so it's probably gone up further since then. So it's nearly 100% of a minimum worker's take-home pay is just the rent for the median rent in Wellington. And since 2009, since we started this chart, a, a worker needs to work six hours longer at work each week just to afford the rent on the same property that they afforded in 2009. So we already work some of the longest hours in the OECD. Um, we, work, we work 15 days at work 
extra in comparison to the average OECD worker, according to the Productivity Commission. But a lot of that is taken just by paying the rent, just by paying the cost um, of housing. So we're all having to work harder. Um, none of us are working smarter, and the people who are making the money are the landlords. So in terms of the cost of living, until we tackle that speculative housing market, which is driven actually by factors other than um, inflation, it's driven by our tax treatment of housing. It's driven by our, the way in which we, we deliver housing. We're not going to tackle that problem. So what does a truly progressive approach to this problem look like? Well, a truly, truly to me, a truly progressive approach places economic well-being of New Zealanders at its heart rather than just economic growth. We need to deliver that productive, sustainable, and inclusive uh, growth, which we often hear politicians talk about, but then actually deliver on it as well as talk about it. In accordance research at Auckland University, increasing unemployment has 10 times the negative well-being impact of increasing inflation. So for me, if we've got a choice, if we're truly going to deliver economic well-being, we need to protect employment. We need to be protecting workers rather than just simply looking to strip inflation out of the system as quickly as we can. And inflation should be borne by those who can pay. And currently, our system loads the costs onto those who have the least ability to pay um, to protect those with assets, as Dr. Burton said before. Um, we currently, we you currently use the OCR track and the OCR lever as the main means of trying to deliver change. That puts more money into the pockets of those who already own assets, who have balances at the bank, and it increases the costs of being a lender in New Zealand. Um, and Jeff has said on alternative ways in which the government could respond um, to the challenges that exist, particularly distributional level, and you certainly won't hear me argue against a better and fairer tax system. Um, to deliver um, on that basis. Um, but one of the things that we certainly don't need to do um, is to provide a tax cut that's loaded to the very highest income earners and those with assets right now. If you take nothing else away, hopefully, from tonight, then um, you know, the idea that what we need to do now to tackle a cost of living crisis is to give more money to landlords um, is not perhaps the most sensible approach um, that you one could possibly take. So in the short run, it's not clear that the current round of competitive interest rates globally um, will tackle the problems that are current, currently driving inflation. Now, um, that might be the case. It might solve it by simply crashing the plane into the side of a mountain. We'll stop the aeroplane, but perhaps not in the most elegant way um, possible. Um, and interest rates should be used to tackle the problems that we face in 18 months' time. When I used to work at the Reserve Bank, that was Graham Wheeler's dictum. It takes 18 months for an OCR change to work its way through the system, to work its way through the markets, to do something. So you should be making interest rate changes with the medium term and the long term in mind, not the short run. Because if you make changes in the short run with, uh, for, for the, the interest rates, you've got to do it much harder and much faster. And if you do that, the consequences are much larger. We should not repeat the mistakes that the Reserve Bank made in 2014. We need to protect the living standards of those with the very lowest incomes, those on the blue line that we had earlier, in terms of those with the lowest 20% of incomes who faced inflation not just over the past six months, but over the past 10 years. We need to do that through change for the welfare payment system, through protecting the minimum wage, through lifting the minimum wage. The best evidence we have around the world is uh, from American and from UK studies is that if you lift the minimum wage by 10%, Food pricing goes up by 0.4%. Pricing generally rises by 0.6%. So the relationship between lifting the minimum wage, despite what you might hear elsewhere, it doesn't feed through to general pricing changes. Um, and we need to make sure that public services are strong and remain well resourced, because one of the areas that people will need to fall on whenever they come to the end of their line with cost, with cost of living pressures when they don't have the money to pay the rent, when they don't have the money to, uh, to, to, to have private medical insurance and other things, they fall upon the state. And if the state isn't resourced and doesn't have the ability to tackle those challenges, then we just end up buying all of the problems that we bought earlier and we do that um, more expensively. 
And just in case you missed it the first time, one of the things that we don't need right now is to provide a tax cut to those loaded at the very top, who are the very, the very top 5% of income earners, who get 10 times the benefit um, of others, and certainly to assist asset owners. And we can talk about the short run, but one of the things I'm really keen for us to think about is actually the long run. Because everything that we should be doing, we should be doing for the long run in inflation. Because we can try and move things around in the short run, and we can do that you know, with a little degree of fidelity. But actually, everything we should be doing is trying to tackle our long run challenges. And so many of the problems that New Zealand faces are the same challenges that we had before COVID-19 in terms of housing and homelessness, in terms of energy and climate change, in terms of market power and market abuse, and in terms of economic insecurity. And actually, these are the things that are driving inflation right now in New Zealand. And so to give one example, if we invest in an electrical vehicle fleet, not only does that tackle future inflation, it has spillover benefits in terms of climate change. It has spillover benefits in terms of uh, the rest of our economy. And so we can make the kinds of smart, sensible investments where actually it, someone will argue, oh, that's just going to increase inflation. That's just increased demand for electric vehicles. All that's going to do is put the pricing up. In the long run, it actually reduces our res reliance on oil, on gas, on diesel. It puts us less at the mercy of those international markets and actually reduces our inflation in the long run. So if we simply go back to normal after COVID-19, during COVID-19, we've spent $74 billion just to keep the wheels going of the economy. And I, for one, don't want to go back to normal because going back to normal means all of these problems. It means homelessness. It means economic insecurity. And so we think there's a role for a stronger state to help tackle the problems that we've talked about tonight, to help tackle the housing crisis and the housing supply, the building material crisis, to help stop uh, uh, landowners from zoning land in particular ways, to stop the development of housing that we need, to make sure that we have the, uh, the transport systems and the other systems that we need to help tackle our, our inflation problems and our congestion problems and our health problems. Um, in future. And unless the state does that heavy lifting, as it did in the 60s and the 70s, then we're not going to help, not going to do that right now because expecting the market to deliver that solution is like repeating the same mistake over and over again. And our relatively strong fiscal position means that we need to look through the current problems that we have and continue to make the in investments essential to do that. Because if we don't, we're just going to buy our future inflation by not making the investments that we need to today. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Jeff and Craig. Now, I think we've got a few moments for a few questions. Uh, just to get us started, uh, Jeff and, and Craig, uh, I'd be very interested in hearing your f reflections on uh, the current government's policy response to these cost of living concerns, thinking of um, things, for example, such as the response to the market study into supermarkets, uh, uh, the uh, um, f uh, public transport fares reduction, things of those nature. Are these things that are the right idea but um, not far enough, or are we um, looking in the wrong direction entirely? Actually, you. Um, well... I have a certain degree of sympathy for the current government. Um, that doesn't mean that I think they're doing the right things. It means that I think they're limited in what they're actually able to do um, because of what I call the iron cage of neoliberal statutes that's around the New Zealand government now. I mean, for a long time, the, the, the neoliberal program was codified into statutes which are still on the statute book and which tightly constrain, if, in fact, uh, how much the government can get away with without exposing itself to a furious onslaught from the critical brigade on the right. And so long as you have a government that's terrified of an onslaught from the critical brigade on the right and enthralled to the clobbering machine and the neoliberal iron cage, its, it's scope for action is is limited, so it doesn't do most of the things that I would like to see them do. 
Um, I'm not sure whether they want to do those things. Uh, when you said, um, Craig mentioned the 1960s and 70s, I, I, I was around in the 90s, so most of you guys were too, looking around. Um, go back to the 1960s and 70s, Keith Holyoke's National Party looks like raving radicals compared to today's Labour Party. I mean, they were running a mixed economy with a strong Ministry of Works and government intervention and a big pile of state housing. Admittedly, Holyoke's National Party weren't hang naturally hanging on to those state houses as much as they should have. But relative to the scope for action not that the Labour Party sees itself having today, it seems to me that our policy makers in the 60s and 70s, one, had more tools at their disposal, two, have much fewer constraints on their freedom to act, and three, were much more willing to actually take the bull by the horns and go solve some problems with some real action. Uh, I think now they're trapped, both ideologically trapped in, in what they're able to conceive of as possible, they're legally trapped by the limitations that, that these, these laws have put on them. Uh, I mean, just one that... Uh, one of the ones that always really, really worries me, because it's had a huge impact on the cost of living problem, is the State Owned Enterprise Act 1986, which remains on the statute book, unchanged. I mean, we've got six, we've, they've been, the Labor government's been within from 2000 to 2008, and then it was in from 2017 to 2021, 22. And I'm still writing articles saying the Commerce Act and the State and Enterprises Act and the Fiscal Responsibility Act, now embedded in the Public Finance Act, need to be repealed and replaced by something sensible, but nothing moves. You know, those great big statutory changes that would free up the margins of the what is possible politically in New Zealand are missing in action, and, uh, and it's fiddling at the edges that goes on. And so, I mean, that's why one of my slides, I said, if we had a left government, we'll dream on. Uh, I don't think we have. And it's very hard to see how we're going to get one, um, given the way people read the polls and run scared out from every time big business says, boo, you know, a left government actually has to look capitalism in the eye and see it off occasionally. And amazingly, you know, Keith Holyoke used to occasionally do that. Bless him. I ne never voted for him, never supported him, and always thought of him as the enemy. But um, by golly, bring him back. <laughs> um, Jeff said that he had a great deal of sympathy for the current government, and you won't hear anything different from me. Um, I guess one of the things that I would say, oh, I'd say two things. Um, first of all, that the government's currently operating under a, a really high degree um, of uncertainty. So none of us have known from month by month, quarter by quarter, we keep being told inflation's going to fall, it'll go back down, and then it doesn't, um, or it gets worse. And so the government necessarily thought it was trying to deal with what it thought was a temporary um, issue. And now we keep being told temporary gets longer and longer and longer. So its responses, I think, need to be sort of framed and characterized in that sense of it's, it was trying to deal with what it thought was a short-run issue, which would go return to normal, and increasingly we're seeing that it's not returning to normal. The second thing I would say is that the government's arguably, not arguably, has, um, has failed to articulate really clearly what good looks like in the economy. What actually it's, what it wants to see. The difference between managing the shop and running the shop. And too often it seemed as if from an economic perspective, the government's keen to manage the shop rather than run the shop. It wants to keep the same settings. It just wants to appear to be a better bank manager rather than actually working out what it wants to do in the economy. And so one of the things I would want to see um, from the government is, yes, there are plenty of short-term measures that you can run. You can give people cost of living payments. Yes, you can increase welfare. But if you can set out what a good economy looks like and then set out what the levers of delivery are that are then going to deliver on that, you've got a fighting chance of doing that and a fighting chance of making that change. Because the right is brilliant at setting out what a good, good, good economy looks like for them and then setting out all the reasons why it's inevitable everything should point in that direction. So we need to set out actually what good looks like from a progressive sense and actually how we then 
get there. Finally, I would say this, is that the government's been beset by problems in delivery of its goals and delivery of its policies. And that comes about as a consequence of if you systematically hollow out public services for 10 years, then it should be unsurprising that you then can't deliver radical change quickly. Um, you need to not only build those public services back up, but you need to do so over a really long period of time and consistently to then give you the ability to deliver. And one of the things I think the government may well be um, shy of is over-promising and making further promises to deliver changes because actually the ability to deliver on that change over the past few years really has been brought into question. And again, that's not its fault. It's a consequence of the many, many years of systematically you know, reducing the delivery capacity of those organizations and getting rid of the organizations, as Jeff talked about, which did that work back in the day in New Zealand. Question from the floor at the back. Uh, slash mini rant by Mike Hosking a couple of weeks ago. I thought it was quite telling. He was simply lamenting the shift of power from capital to labour, caused in his view by the, by the tight, lab, tight labour market. And he was sort of in particular complaining about the government's immigration policy. I think the subtext was he couldn't be rude to Ospo staff anymore. So I just wondered what you thought about that. And, and on the bright note, I thought the midterms were great in the States. So there's always been this. Thank you. Uh, I generally try to avoid anything written by Mike um, Hosking. Um, uh, it, you know, um, generally speaking, um, it doesn't do much for my blood pressure, which is already pretty high. Um, uh, and, and secondly, it tends to be a load of nonsense. Um, so um, you know, the idea that we've had this, this huge wave of, of, of power transitioning from, from capital um, to labor, um, I would that it were so. Um, you know, that would be delightful. What would be the markers um, of that? Would it be that wages were rising enormously, that workers were able to demand power? Would it be that suddenly that we didn't need fair pay agreements because workers were listened to by their employer? Um, no, we, we, we need all of these things precisely because the terms of trade haven't shifted. They're still loaded to the employer. They're still loaded to capital. Workers on the minimum wage who are just about keeping their heads above water and who are just paying the rent, they don't have market power. Um, they don't, they don't, they're not perceiving, they're not waking up in the morning and saying, do you know what, I suddenly feel more powerful all of a sudden. Um, they're, they're simply getting by day to day. And so I would love it that Mike Hosking had noticed a transition of power to the workers. As you say, I think it's just a bit more likely that Mike got told off when he was, when he was insulting a hospital worker. Nevertheless, there's a very long-running story about the bargaining power of labour. Um, it's a class war account given by those who won the class war back in the 80s and 90s. And it, well, there was a genuine contest. It's important not to forget that organised labour and the organised political left were a huge force for much of the 20th century before they were caved in, undermined and collapsed by the... Uh, the policies switch and the ideological tides of the 1980s and 1990s. So the underlying conflicts of interest haven't gone away. The nature of wage work has changed, but the fundamental difference between wage work, well, for, with wages rather, profits and rents, remains as the crucial underpinning of how the capitalist economy moves forward. And it, as it moves more and more to being a feudal rather than a capitalist economy, uh, ideas that used to be around in economics 200 years ago uh, are, are coming back into, into focus. And one of those ideas, and David Ricardo's Principles of Economics, um, is that the growing share of rentiers in the product squeezes the return to capitalists unless the capitalists can squeeze the workers. And that question of passing the parcel backwards and forwards across the great classes of income earners has been a sort of theme of, of centuries now of, of economic history. So bringing it right down to next year, um, there's an election next year. 
One of the central issues is going to be fair pay agreements. The legislation's gone through this year. The negotiation and, and conclusion of those agreements will take a lot of next year. How many of them will have been done before the election, we do not know. But if you've been listening to Paul Goldsmith, uh, you will know that the next election will be fought partly on the question of whether we do or do not want to codify a little wee bit more bargaining power for workers at the most deprived end of the labour market. And uh, I hope you're all going to vote in that election, and I hope you won't be voting for repealing the fair pay agreement legislation. Uh, any of you are, come and see me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> And the child and the government's child poverty reduction strategy. Um, surely they can be argued to be long-term thinking. Uh, yeah, I'm just keen to hear you reflect on all that you've said in light of these examples of government policy. Yeah, I'm kind of reluctant to attach the word thinking to either of them. <laughs> And, and there, in essence, is the problem. I mean, Craig made the point, I think, really well, that the, 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 there is a need to articulate the good in some credible, meaningful way that has operational, concrete bits to it. All right? The Treasury's well-being framework is largely mush. It you know, sounds good. It's keeping a lot of people very busily occupied writing important-sounding papers. But when you boil it right down to the nitty gritty, we still have to find out if it has a skeleton or not. You know, and if it's invertebrate, it's a jellyfish, and jellyfishes don't think a lot. Um, now, the, the other one that you mentioned, child the child poverty, um, I think has been, a, has been a real problem in the sense that while a useful target was articulated at the start, the various levers that you could see that would have to be pulled to make it happen were one by one sort of set aside and in many cases were locked immobile by putting padlocks on them. And it seems to me that if, uh, if you're going to pursue something as important as child poverty reduction, it has to be wholehearted, it can't be half-hearted. And my fear is that it's been half-hearted, uh, if that. And as a result, a lot of that stuff gets discredited, you know, because you have the government desperate to say, we've made progress, you know, and citing any statistic they can find that looks even marginally better as signs of the huge progress they've made. Uh, and I just look at the number of poor kids around and the fact that things aren't getting that much better for them that fast and think there's a, there's a, there's a vacuum there to be filled. And um, I mean, this... this the worrying thing about this government is that it, all, this, all the policy space is to the left of it. Anybody who credibly puts together a package to occupy that policy space, you know, has a huge amount of stuff they could do. If the ACT Party rewrote its charter and changed its spots, you know, if it, if it really wants to colonise a bit of useful policy space, there's an awful lot of room out there. I, for one, would welcome if the ACT Party wants to change its spots. Um, I'd be delighted. We, in fact, we can offer them some advice um, in that space. Um, uh, um, however, um, I, w I was hoping we would get through the night without disagreeing, um, Jeff, but um, one of the things I will disagree with you on is the well-being framework. Um, and the, my argument is, is not, fundament not fundamental to yours. I actually think the well-being framework is a really important move for the Treasury in moving away from just taking a very narrow accounting view of how the world should operate. The challenge we have is not whether or not we should have a well-being framework and whether or not, whether or not we should use a well-being framework. I think we should. The challenge is actually in, is it done? Because we have a, we, we write a, if you read every budget document, there'll be a chapter now at the front, every well-being document, there'll be a chapter at the front that goes, uh, goes well-being analysis. And it will take you through, you know, our waterways are polluted, uh, you know, um, air is polluted, uh, you know, we don't build enough housing. Um, Māori or Pacifica families don't tend to do as well as others on these particular indicators. And then you lick your finger and you turn the page and there's a complete disconnect between that analysis and the spending. Because what you've done is you've outlined all the problems, you now understand 
all the problems. But what you can't do is go from those problems to the spend. What you can't do is go from those problems to then how is that going to change? The, how is this spending program going to change these indicators? So the problem isn't the well-being framework or the living standards framework. They're just a tool. They're just a better means of understanding the real problems we have in the economy. Um, the real challenge we have is in operationalizing that in new and in better ways. Because if we can pull off that trick, then actually we will have genuinely delivered a world being and, and well-being um, uh, budget. Um, in terms of child poverty, um, one of the things I, I, I would say um, is, is this, is that we had a highly, highly opportunistic um, uh, um, in 2017, um, National Party tell us that it would suddenly lift child poverty um, by reduce the numbers of children living in poverty by 50,000. Um, having not cared to that date about any number or anything else. And it did so not because it had any kind of principled position in that space, but just because it felt exposed. Um, the, gov the government genuinely does have a commitment to reducing child poverty, does have a commitment to reaching those targets. But as Jeff has said, one of the things it has done is to try to, try to fight with one hand tied behind its back. Um, one of the biggest challenges we know in terms of child poverty is housing. And so we can't tackle child poverty unless we tackle housing. So let's tackle housing. One of the biggest problems we know in terms of, in terms of delivering on our material well-being goals, the ma number of children who live in material um, poverty in New Zealand, is actually the amount of food we can get to children who don't get two hot meals a day. But we can solve that problem tomorrow with schools. So why don't we? Um, there are plenty of things that we can do. We've just chosen to concentrate on the income lever on one side. And, it's, and without tackling the supply and the other levers on the other side. And we need to do both because unless we get both we're just going to recreate the problems um, in the future. And, and, and if I can end with this sort of, there, at the last measure, there were 125,000 kids who live in material poverty in New Zealand. Um, in a country as, as wealthy as New Zealand, that's a sin. And so there isn't an acceptable number for material poverty in New Zealand. So we should tackle that regardless of whoever's in office. Right, um, we've reached the end of our time here in this space, um, unfortunately. Um, but before we go, I'd um, be grateful if you could join me in thanking once again our two excellent speakers today.